Um, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for coming. My name is Jenny Rathbone. I'm the Assembly Member for Cardiff Central, and I'm also a member of the Climate Change, Environment and Rural Affairs Committee, which obviously has responsibility for this area of public policy. Um, I was also on the predecessor Environment Committee, which produced the Smart Energy um, for Wales um, a Smart Energy Future for Wales report, which I think has some very um, robust recommendations, which um, if you haven't read it already, you know, um, hopefully that will, you'll find that useful. Um, I just want to um, say that this is the third in a series of um, seminars um, working with the Learning Society of Wales to enable us to exchange ideas both with each other in the assembly, but also more importantly with you, the public, who elect us to come and um, represent your interests. Um, so I, it's fantastic to see so many people here today on this really important issue. Um, but I'd be really grateful if you could also tell us how useful you found this seminar um, before you leave. Um, I think there's an evaluation form on your chair. Uh, because we need to know whether, you know, this is the best time of day or breakfast series or, you know, and in terms of the format as well. Um, but I think the, we're going to have a lively discussion today and I will hope to get as many of your contributions in as possible in the time available uh, because we've got a, a really um, high-level list of, uh, of speakers um, who... The, the, it's all in the, um, I think you've all got the guide as to who everybody is, so uh, we won't, I won't repeat um, how eminent they are, but um, they're between them. I think they're going to be able to cover all the bases on this important subject. Um, so I think, Nina, are you due to go first? I think I am. Excellent. So, so would you like to come to the lectern? Not a problem. And uh, each speaker is going to make us a brief contribution of no more than five minutes. Five and then we'll open the uh, discussion to the floor. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for having me here. Um, I'm Nina Skrupska, I'm the Chief Executive from the Renewable Energy Association. Um, just a, a little background on that, we represent over 600 member organisations covering all forms of renewable and lobby actively for them all, but we have a, a sister trade association called Renewable UK who lobby hard for the wind uh, industry as well. So we cover electricity, heat, transport and smart technology now because things are rapidly changing. So why am I speaking to you today? Well, let's cover a little bit background in my five minutes. We've, the UK has achieved extraordinary feats over the quarter of our electricity now is from renewables. We've led the world in decoupling growth from carbon emissions, and the sector has grown to employ over 125,000 jobs in 2016, and about 6,000 jobs of those are here in Wales. You'll be able to see the breakdown of that in a report which we're publishing next week and presenting to the Minister, Richard Harrington, in, in um, Westminster, um, which breaks it all down for you. So you can see where those jobs are and what's going on. And we believe that those jobs linked to renewable energy and clean technology could treble because the opportunity is extraordinary. There's over a million homes and businesses that have installed PV panels, and we've made great strides towards decarbonising heating in our homes. And our transport system is becoming less polluting, but has still got an awful lot to do. I don't know how many of you have seen a paper from the Committee on Climate Change, the committee that looks after the fact as whether the UK government is delivering on its commitments made in the Climate Change Act, which is our own law, not a European law. And they revealed in November that the strides that we've made with power, now being close to 25% renewables, has revealed transport as the leading culprit for delivering the most CO2. The 33 million cars on our roads, only 100,000 are linked with a battery or electric vehicle solution. 
and heavy goods vehicles, marine and shipping, they're not even quite yet on the radar for transforming. But we have to work harder on that, and the innovative British industry is truly growing to its full potential. Policy upgrades, and that's why we're here, to talk about what now needs to go forward to fulfil this potential here in Wales and for Great Britain, particularly with the Brexit umbrella hanging over our heads. What will make that difference for delivering a low carbon future here that we need to deliver? It's not a choice. We're committed to doing it. But also, we can be world leaders as our signatories as part of the G19 now, rather than the G20 to the Paris commitment. So I think with the rapid global cost declines, I don't know how much of you know how, how fast solar panels have come down in price, and now, really excitingly, the battery storage side of things, which completely does away with the view of the concerns of variability, or that dreaded word intermittency that the fossil uh, brigade argue for uh, solar and, and wind. But what it's also done is transformed and revolutionized how we look at energy today. Renewables has helped with the democratization of energy. Our homes are power plants now for many of us. I'm a prosumer. My energy bills, because I've had my house insulated and panels on there, has reduced my energy bill to one-fifth. That opportunity we have not yet tapped as a ways of doing that, and for local authorities and councils to be leaders in that would be amazing. So I believe renewables can deliver a resource-efficient, decentralised, democratic and secure energy system, and I'm happy to answer any of your questions of how we're going to do it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and so I'll, I'll stick to the order on, uh, on the um, paper. So Professor Max Mundy, if you'd like to come forward and tell us uh, what the business opportunities are and uh, creation of jobs. Well, I'm very relieved I don't have to talk from an armchair because uh, that would be very dangerous. I mean, I'm used to speaking standing up, so that's, that's, uh, that's good news. I want to focus... Um, uh, I'm going to speak to something quite narrow here, something that's very, uh, very close to my heart. I'm going to talk about regional electricity generation um, uh, in, in particular here. And I want to, you know, the context of this is Welsh government ambition around uh, renewables and general uh, electricity uh, generation. So I'm just going to make just a couple of quick points in, in, uh, in my five minutes. As we go forward, as our ge generation, uh, the distribution of our energy, uh, energy generation capacity varies as renewables take up a bigger part of the mix, I think it's very, very important to think about as we go forward, as we grant planning permissions, as we get new developments, it's very, very important to think about what those, um, what those new developments, what they might mean in terms of Welsh employment, Welsh economic activity, the support of Welsh jobs. I am by no means discounting the importance of uh, uh, renewable, uh, renewable energy development on offshore wind, solar, PV, in terms of meeting our renewal targets. But there is a challenge as well, I think, for Welsh government, for Welsh institutions, to also think about what those new technologies mean for Welsh employment, Welsh economic opportunity. It'll be no news to any of you, as you look, if you look around the, the UK, if you go on the Renewables UK website, if you look at where the natural resource is in terms of wind and tidal, it's of, of, often adjacent to communities where you have serious socio-economic uh, problems. So we do need to think about renewables capacity, new renewables capacity, and how far that might, as well as meeting our climate change um, commitments, how far that might also be used to generate economic outcomes for, um, for, 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 for local communities. And I have to say, the record so far is probably quite disappointing. I mean, when we look at on, um, onshore wind, you know, some of the offshore wind that's in Wales, solar PV, the, 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 the number of jobs that are actually created in Wales during development, during planning, during construction, during operations, 
it's quite small. Okay, we would expect that, wouldn't we? Because Wales is a small economy. I mean, we've got three million people. There are going to be limits to the supply side, but I still think that's a very, very important thing to think about in, um, uh, in, in the Smarter Energy for Wales document. It's interesting, in the things that Wales must do, the supply side development, there are 19 what Wales must do in this, the supply side is number 19 in this. I think the supply side needs to be a little bit further um, up the agenda. It was very interesting, wasn't it, when we were, uh, I mean, the tidal lagoon uh, in Swansea, um, it's, it's created a lot of debate. One of the things that was quite interesting about the tidal lagoon development was that there were quite a lot of potential opportunities for the Welsh supply side. And we don't always see that in other renewables, uh, renewables developments. Um, it, the, the other thing I'd, I, I would like to say, as we go forward, I think, when we look at uh, renewables, I accept again that some of the most interesting renewables in terms of economic development prospects are also some of the more costly ones, and they're often earlier in their life cycle. So, you know, we have to, we very much have to factor, you know, factor that in. There is, you know, there is a bit of a trade-off between cost and uh, economic, development, uh, economic development prospects. My argument would be, I think, that as, we, as renewables take up a greater proportion of Welsh energy, uh, electricity uh, generation, you'll see the employment connected to that much more dispersive out, uh, throughout Wales and much, much more difficult to identify. Much, much more difficult to identify. So, in closing, um, what, would be, what would be my conclusions? And I... I throw, yeah, this might be a bit contentious, but uh, here goes. I mean, what have we seen in Wales in recent, uh, in recent times as we look at renewables? I would argue, with some exceptions, uh, which uh, I've no doubt might, you might throw up during the questions, but what we normally see is decisions on capital investment in renewables, the high value components uh, uh, in renewables, the managing contractors in renewables, the maintenance contracts uh, on uh, renewables, are largely, uh, largely relate to decisions that are made outside of the Welsh economy. And I would argue in economic speak that many of the returns that we get to renewables in Wales are returns to labour as opposed to returns to capital. And I think that's something we need to, con you know, we do need to consider. I mean, it was interesting in the in the in the document that you've got on your um, on your chairs. I mean, it's talking about a you know a not for profit uh, uh, company with respect to the. Jenny's making me nervous here, standing by my side. But but yeah. So, I th you know, just to close, you know, my final sentence. Don't assume. Never make the assumption. The proximity to these high quality natural resources that we have in terms of tidal and wind, it doesn't necessarily mean that Wales is going to be, to be able to capitalise on the economic outcomes. We need to think very, very seriously about that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, very important point. Uh, we're now going to hear from Professor Howell Thomas, who's the Pro Vice Chancellor of research, innovation, and something else at Cardiff University, and is um, head, going to talk about a, a European-funded uh, project called Flexus. Thank you very much, Jenny. Um, so I'm here really, to, as Jenny said, to talk about a research project, research and development and innovation, and hopefully leading to economic impact, called Flexus. It's a WEFO-funded project. It's what WEFO describe as a backbone project. So it is, it is receiving very significant sums of money right now from WEFO. The total value of the project is of the order of 25 million pounds. I think the, 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 I guess the first thing I want to draw to your attention is that the three universities in South Wales um, are key partners in this project. We've come together in a strategic manner, um, bringing together the kind of leading work in each university um, to look at this in a sort of holistic way, in a pan-Wales manner. We're also, I'm pleased to say, working with Aberystwyth and with Bangor, and we also have the BGS as 
collaborators and partners in this, so I'm hoping that we've covered the bases very well. Um, one of the, I'm, I'm the so-called lead principal investigator. One of the, uh, my fellow principal investigators is uh, Andy Barron, who'll be speaking next, who's the Secretary Chair in Swansea in Energy. Um, so I think it's, I, I want to stress that it is, you know, we, we are working as a collective group of university in this, on this, in this area and hoping to make significant advances. Um, 25 million sounds like an awful lot of money and it is an awful lot of money, uh, there's no doubt about that. But the agenda here is so large and so wide and I would argue the research challenges remain quite significant that you know, it will probably need more money than this to keep going and so on. And certainly we're not isolated here in Wales, we're very connected to other strong research areas across the UK and across Europe and across the world. It is mainly um, from the sort of hard technology engineering background, but I'm also very pleased to bring to your attention that we very, very much uh, work with the social science community. Here at Cardiff University, we have Nick Pigeon and Karen Henwood, who many of you will know, who are leading players in this area, as very much part of the, of the team. And as you would expect, since this is a WEFO-funded project, WEFO's um, views and thoughts, um, as quite correctly, I think, embodied in all the work they do, involve the so-called cross-cutting themes. Um, fuel poverty and poverty alleviation in general are very important for for WEFO funding, and we certainly embrace all of that. The key thing, of course, for us is high quality research. That's what we're funded to do. This is a particular WEFO stream that has been put together to support high quality research and critical mass in the universities. So that's a primary objective to expand our expertise and, and develop that. But in order to make it particularly relevant for Wales, which is extremely important, what, we've also, what we're also doing is we've we're going to be demonstrating what we're doing and developing what we're doing in a place-based demonstrator. Um, it is obviously, goes without saying, that is here in Wales, that is down in the Swansea Bay region. It's actually in Neath Port Talbot, Borough Council. It starts at the western end at what is basically the Swansea Bay Second Campus, or to make it relevant to what's been said already, it's actually where the Tidal Lagoon will be built, the Swansea Tidal Lagoon will be built if it gets permission to go ahead, and obviously we certainly hope from our perspective it does. It is then will be, will include all the area around Swansea Bay back past the steelworks in Port Talbot, um, back towards the sort of uh, eastern boundary of Neath Port Talbot, and then it will run some distance up the Neath Valley, and so all of that area is going to be our demonstration study area. Right at the heart of it is the Tata Steelworks, um, and for a variety of reasons, which I'm sure that you can all relate to, energy consumption, CO2 emission, uh, employment characteristics here in Wales is a key, key area, and it's going to be a very major focus area for our work. Um, we will be hearing, I suspect, a little bit later on from Andrew about ideas such as carbon utilization, very, very interesting novel areas of research. Um, we're hoping to uh, have some demonstration, technical demonstrations there, but we're also hoping to have a public sort of central node. I can see Jenny has stood up, so I'd better go and sit down myself. Jenny, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Howell, and I'm very glad you mentioned um, fuel poverty because uh, we have had seminars from people on how people use their electricity and the impact on their health, and those are important issues um, as well. So um, last but not least, um, um, Professor Andrew Barron from Swansea University, who's part of the Flexis project, who's also got some really interestingly provocative ideas on how we can... Um, take forward um, our energy policy here in Wales. Uh, professor Barron, thank you. Well, having been a uh, professor now for 30-something years, I get the right to be controversial and upset people. So we'll start with that, and then I'll start 
talking about what real problems are. So we'll get one thing out of the way. So at the end of what I'm going to talk about in five minutes is natural gas. OK, we've got that out of the way. Now let's start on the problems of carbon. Carbon capture, sequestration, carbon utilization. And one of the things, that especially the UK government is targeting, is decreasing carbon emissions and carbon capture uh, and sequestration. We, we heard that uh, transportation is a major problem. Well, we've got a number of ways that Wales can reach its 80% targets. One of the key ones is, tomorrow we shut Port Talbot. End of story. That's 40%. In, major industry in Wales is 40% of CO2 emissions. Of that 40%, over 50% is Tadar steel and the surrounding area. 20% of Wales' emissions. So we can, and air pollution that goes along with that. So we've got a choice. Our choice is we turn around and say, we've got a highly polluted uh, uh, CO2 emission environment. The other is to say that South Wales is the Saudi Arabia of CO2 because CO2 could be a resource. So I'm gonna talk about unconventional gas as an energy source. CO2 is that unconventional gas. We, not just reducing it, industry, heavy industry in Wales will not be able to replace with lithium ion batteries that will devastate Argentina and Bolivia for their mining. It will have to continue doing re, uh, its production. So one of the projects that we're looking at is how do you take CO2 emissions such that places like Tata uh, Tarmac, the cement producers, Huntsman, uh, Corning, um, Aceman Chemical can all claim to be CO2 zero emissions because you take that CO2 and convert it to something useful. The other part of that equation is you need the energy to do that. At present in Wales, we've got a lot of wind energy, we've got a lot of solar energy. However, the overall efficiency of that energy is 30%. I, mean, I don't mean the cell is 30%. I mean that of the of capacity that we have to produce energy, most of the time, or a lot of the time, we're not doing it. And Wales is doing better than Scotland, but it's still a problem. Well, if we took that energy that can't be even placed into the grid, and we use it to produce, for example, hydrogen that can be done uh, very simply, that allows you to take CO2 catalytically, again, now at low cost, now you can start to make the replacement materials that you are all sitting and wearing, you've eaten probably some of it today, that actually came from petroleum. So instead of using petroleum, we use our major resource here in Wales, which is carbon dioxide. Now that would be only one part. So if we, if we make Port Talbot's zero sit carbon emissions, we've knocked off 20%. You've still got quite a long way to go. So carbon sequestration is gonna be the next challenge. Unfortunately, in the UK, reservoirs that would allow you to do carbon sequestration would only allow uh, present emission rates of about 10 to 20 years. That's how much carbon we could capture. Now, I said it'd be controversial, so here's the controversy. If you take natural gas out of shale and put CO2 in, in there, shale absorbs three times more carbon dioxide as natural gas was out there. So by taking the, share, the gas out, you burn it, fine, you make CO2, you put that CO2 back, you put two more CO2s back. Now one of the issues that I can ask a quiz and maybe someone will answer it in the question and answer is how long has the natural gas here in the UK been inside that shale? I'm not gonna answer yet, but we developed under an Innovate UK and uh, an NRN project which is uh, EU funded uh, through Welsh government, the ability to allow the CO2 to replace that gas and become trapped for that same period of time. So now you've got the ability of, you want to tackle the carbon problem of industry which cannot change its production, right? Steel production will always produce carbon emissions. Even when you go to electric first, 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 first arc furnaces, get that right, uh, you'll still be producing CO2. A lot of other industry produces CO2 inherently, even if they use no energy that produces CO2. Cement production is one of them. So if we can capture that CO2, we can convert it to something useful. We can convert it to the materials that we all use, the chemicals we all use, the polymers we all use, the foodstuffs we all use. We have a project where we're hoping by the first demonstrator is gonna be cheese. And cheese produced from carbon dioxide that uh, comes out of one of uh, Tata Steel's chimneys, right? So if you can produce those sorts of resources and you're not using hydrocarbons, the traditional hydrocarbon, 
that becomes very important. The last thing I'll say is that it's always important to understand, no matter what uh, green energy you think about or renewable energy you think about, you have to think of the global impact, not just the impact for Wales. So we've heard there's 3 million people, according to DVLA, there's about 1.5 million cars here. If over the next 10 years the Welsh Government insisted we all switch to Nissan Leafs, Teslas, whatever, um, we would actually consume the entire planet's production of lithium. Right? The mining of that is horrendously polluting. So if we're going to look for green energy technologies, storage, battery storage, wind, and so on, we need to think of the, what materials and approaches we can take that will not transfer our pollution to somewhere else on the planet. And I'll sit down. First time a politician's ever talked. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, we've had some questions submitted in advance, and I think most of them are from people who are in the audience. Um, sticking with the, um, the last speaker's contribution, um, I think, is Janadi Mashur is here? No, uh, well... Uh, yes. I beg your pardon, I didn't see you. <laughs> um, do you want to repeat your question, or do you want... Yes. <laughs> okay, maybe I immediately start with the second part because first is provocation. So this, the second was, uh, uh, do we think any chance that uh, coming actually to both talks of the first and the last speaker, can we do on a maybe not large but minor scale something that producing uh, it's extraction, uh, extracting shell gas and simultaneously uh, using CO2 sequestration in the same way as you just mentioned. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, are there any other related questions to um, the use of shale gas and capture of CO2? A gentleman at the back, do you want to just say what you want to ask? Hello. Yeah, uh, Sid Morgan from the uh, Morgan Academy, Swansea University. The connection, I think, that needs to be made in relation to particularly what Professor Barron said about shale gas is the connection with locality and local benefit. And um, I think we all of us need, if we're going to develop these ideas, to develop a concept, which is quite common throughout the world, called national interest. And if we can develop uh, these ideas within the context of something that we have yet to invent called the Welsh national interest, then I think we are likely to make progress on solving these problems. Okay. Um, if I could briefly ask the other three speakers to give their views on this, because I think we know the answer from Andrew, um, and then you can come back, okay? But if you'd like to keep it brief, because we, we want to cover a series of subjects. Um, is it possible for the speakers to all use a, have you got a microphone that they can use so they don't have to be getting up and down like yo-yos? I think, we, are we all still mic'd up? I think yes, we, are. we are. Oh, you're yeah. mic'd up, no problems. I beg your pardon, I didn't see that. Um, right, who'd, who'd like to go first? Um, Nina, do you want to um, um, give your view on this? Uh, well, probably would take up the whole session. No, well, you said it really be, you're brief. Going to be brief. <laughs> Just for everybody's awareness, I've got a doctorate in coal combustion and I've run gas-fired power stations and I've looked at CCS projects over the last 30 years too. And as the CEO of the REA, we don't have a pop at any other technology. We promote how good renewables are. And with that in mind, the belief for me is there is a concern that by 2030, we must reduce our CO2 emissions by 57%. And to look at investing in an infrastructure which taps into more fossil fuel uh, sources um, and for organizations and businesses like the one I used to work for, to admit that it's only in transition for 10 years is a total anathema to me. Because the people who would then be wanting to invest in that resource we were wanting to be mining it and extracting it for at least 50 years for the returns to their shareholders, many of which that may not be as green or climate change inclined. So my view is, engineering-wise and technically-wise, absolutely, everything's doable. I'm an engineer. Commercial, 
financial best benefit for the community? I'm not so sure. Okay, thank you. Max Mundy, um, particularly this idea about capturing yeah. the CO2 um, we're already generating from I, our heavy industry. I guess my, my, my only comment, I can't speak for the uh, technology, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not an engineer, but um, not a chemist either, but um, the only thing I would say, it sounds very interesting, but these big CO2 emitters, I mean, you mentioned Dow Corning, Valero, um, Tata Steel, I think we have to be realistic. I mean, whether we like it or not, there'll be big question marks over many of those big CO2 po point producers in Wales as to how far they are going to be here in 15 years' time. For example, I mean, Dow Corning, I mean, their main feedstock is a, what they call it, a POP, isn't it? A persistent organic pollutant. So, you know, that there, there could, could be issues with their long term operations. And many of these, you know, operations are quite marginal. And of course, and, uh, you know, if we did move to a hard Brexit, some of these operations, particularly Dow Corning, I mean, less so Valero, Tata, look very, very vulnerable, um, would look very, very vulnerable to uh, hard tariffs, WTO tariffs on their outputs, and in some cases, their inputs as well. That's uh, all, all, all I can offer on that. Thank you, much. We'll come back to that. Um, Professor Thomas, you are an engineer. I am an engineer of technology. I think the, the thing I would like just to add to what Andy said is that um, it is important to see these things in an international context. And the ideas that Andy uh, is developing along with others within the project and outside are also being pursued in other parts of the world. I mean, the, the German government has recently put in large sums of money into um, the, what, the Max Planck Institute that's, that's interested in this area on the subject of carbon utilization. Carbon capture is one thing. What Andy's talking about is using the, the, carb the CO2 after it has been captured to create new products. Now, you know, I think I relate to the points made by the gentleman at the back about the Welsh national interest. You know, what this actually potentially opens up, and it's, it's a huge potential only at the moment. I, was, I hope Andy's not going to kill me for saying this, but it's, it's the German approach at the moment is at least a 10-year research program to make this, see if this will work. But it opens up a whole new stream of, um, of supply chains and economics uh, that can then follow from that because you're creating lots of new products. I, I love the, you know, the cheese. Can you imagine, you know, coming here in a few years' time and eating tartar cheese? And, then, <laughs> and I've got to give Andy 10 out of 10 for PR. He's really on the top of his game. Um, now, it may not be cheese. It may be other things. It may be coming out of combinations of tartar and Welsh water and sewage treatment works. So, you know, there's all sorts of things that could, could be evolving here. But I think there are ideas that are that have traction in the, in the science research community. We're not alone in that. Um, I guess I'll stop at that point. I hope that's of some value. A okay. yeah. uh, couple of quick things is, is uh, following up from Hal's comment, is we're, we're uh, starting a WEFO project, which is to take that concept at Tata. Um, but getting back to this issue of tariffs, if Welsh industry does not do this now, come Brexit, there will be a border around Europe and you will not be exporting into Europe. Okay, I'm gonna put on the, uh, sort of the, the worst case scenario. But steel, the Germans are mo trying to push towards low emission steel. If you can produce low emission steel or zero carbon emission steel, every car manufacturer is gonna put it on the window of their car when you go into the, sale, the showroom. So there are worries of tariffs if industry doesn't address that. The other thing which I think you might have misunderstood what I said was that the plans the UK government at the moment have for sequestration would only give about 10 years worth of sequestration. If we switch to shale, UK has five to 700 years of sequestration capacity. And the reason is, is the reservoirs that are used for sequestration are few and far between. Shale is, even if it doesn't even have natural gas in it, is the most common uh, crust rock there is and is ge generic across the planet. Thank you. I think we'll, we'll move on. I'm sure there's lots of uh, potential uh, further debate on that, but you can do that uh, after the uh, formal seminar is completed. Um, is Alexander Phillips here from WWF? Hello? Behind the pier. 
<laughs> Would you want to ask your question? I, I was building on that, the references we've had to Brexit. Um, once now, I was curious about that doesn't seem to be spoken about is the single energy market and the use of interconnectors. Um, in terms of if we go for down the hardest Brexit route, um, what implications could that have on the role of in interconnectors in import and export in energy into the British grid? And how do you think that could have a medium to long term impact on how we generate in this country? Obviously, the speakers have already hinted that there are serious implications. Um, is anybody else who wants to ask a, a Brexit related question or a, a European funded related question? Because WEFO means Welsh European Funding Organisation. Um, could you just say who you are? Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is William Jones. I work for Citizens Advice and I'm an energy champion. As you mentioned, WEFO, I think it was Howell mentioned in the uh, weapon funding that you have. There's an element to do with fuel poverty. I just wonder if you could tell us a bit more about that and what research you're doing in that area. Thank you. Howell, do you want to just deal with that first? Uh, um, yeah, I mean, I guess you know, across the board, uh, let me pick on one. You know, we, we happen to be working at the moment, it is only one example, but we happen to be working at the moment on a project which is about taking heat from abandoned coal mines. Now, it so happens, it's with Bridgen County Borough Council, I think it's a well-known project. Uh, it, so happens that, that it so happens that our abandoned coal mines are in areas of, of you know, relative deprivation. Um, is it feasible to do so? Is it possible? I mean, and that's exactly what we're trying to find out. Um, the temperatures are not expected to be very high, but the technology that's available today, heat pump technology, should make it feasible for us to, to do so. We're actually looking at the moment with Bridgend on a 300 sort of uh, district heating network uh, sort of house plan. Um, it, it leads me honestly, if I may, just, just for one moment, the key to making these things work is what my colleagues call the multi-vector approach. So you don't just look at heat and you don't look at gas and you don't look at electricity on its own. You look at it in the combined way and if you take that example of uh, taking heat out of the mine, abandoned mines, one of the big sort of potential problems, if I can put it like that, is the electricity cost to pump the water up from wherever it is. It could be at some depth below ground. If, however, you have an integrated system and that electricity is available in sort of different ways and at different rates and different tariffs or whatever they are, those projects become much more feasible. So that's exactly one of the areas that we're looking at in, within the Flexis project, um, and I should have stressed that a little bit more in my introduction, plus a lot more focus on distribution and the distribution systems, complementing the points that have been made about generation and the importance of all those, which kind of links back to the interconnected question, you know, because uh, it's so much to, in the future is going to be about having intelligence systems that allow the electricity to be used in the appropriate way, coupled with the points that you made about the batteries, of course. I hope that's helpful. Right. Um, do you want to go next I, I, on, on I, I Brexit? Can, I can talk. I mean, I gave evidence at the Select Committee in the um, well last year, in fact, about the impact of Brexit would have on the energy markets, and the REA and all of our members definitely believe being part of the uh, the single energy market is is really important. You know, the energy, uh, both heat transport, but electricity in particular, uh, is, is so interconnected. I mean, I know some of our members were very excited that, okay, we become separate from Europe, we can do local networks, and off we go, we'll make lots of money, ta-da-da. It, it, it doesn't work like that. Our rules, our regulations, our standards, everything around transmission systems, our trading systems, the EU ETS, our carbon trading, it's all connected, and none of those questions have been answered yet about what uh, the difference between a hard Brexit would be and a soft Brexit. As the REA, we are working very hard to make sure that we stay as linked up in making sure that UK standards pr prevail in, the, in Europe, but also the excellent work in Europe we can inco incorporate in providing solutions here in the UK. Um, in terms of fuel poverty, this is something that's really close to my heart and the rule of thumb for everybody is energy efficiency first. 
even before you start thinking about renewables. And, and I'm so excited about the advent of some uh, industries and home builders that are dealing with now zero carbon homes. The UK government did us a massive disservice when they wound back their commitment to zero carbon homes in 2016. And if we're still part of Europe, we have to do it for 2019 anyway. And I know the Welsh government, and particularly in Port Harbour, supporting you know, the specific programme and some demonstrators that are going to be delivered. And that's really cutting edge. Because making sure the construction industry, as well as the retrofit industry, know how to deal with the energy efficiency and then put renewables on that, the energy, your bills just drop dramatically. So all of this business about an energy cap, it's bollocks. Just deal with the properties. And the other thing, if you haven't switched energy provider now and you're still stuck on a standard tariff, I have to say you're crazy. Move now and you can save £300 off that energy bill. So there's some simple clear directions that the Welsh Government can do is make sure everybody's homes are warm, energy efficient, and then help them understand what they have, the choices they are, have from using their energy. If anybody can run an app on their phone, like every young person can now, and even I can, and I'm 55, and I control my heating in my house, people will suddenly cotton on to how they can make money from their homes. Yeah, the mass house builders are risk averse, so it's going to require regulation to get them to change, in my view. But obviously that comes back to the Welsh Government. Um, but just looking at the, the wider issues around uh, Brexit and the future use of interconnectors for importing and exporting electricity. Um, Max, do you want to go first? Or? Oh, well... Um I mean, I mean what, what's the role of the national grid here as yeah. opposed to having a local Welsh grid? I mean, Can I just interject something yeah. which I think yeah. fits in with this, the poverty issue yeah. as well as this interconnect issue? That uh, you know, we're, we're still stuck on the idea of a national grid or an international grid, if you want, uh, where energy is bought sold between large areas. But when you do start talking about the specific project and the type of houses where uh, you know, we have a, a temporary building outside my building, which specific built, that generates so much power. It's a classroom, but it generates so much power. Uh, they use it for um, uh, charging electric cars. Okay. Um, and so we should stop thinking about this issue of a wider grid and start thinking about uh, feed-in tariff is a bad way, but a uh, sort of phrase, but thinking more in, in regional, especially in rural areas, where it becomes multiple sources. Yes, you've got the national grid, but if you've got solar, you're not at home, hopefully, during the day when it's actually generating here in even sunny Wales. Uh, when the wind doesn't blow, you're not generating. When the wind blows too much, you're not generating because the grid can't take it. Well, if you can store that energy, whether it be in battery form for hydrogen and then reuse it, yes, the physics of it says you lose power or energy at every step, but the point being then that becomes a distribution where every household can generate excess energy that is shared amongst their neighbors. Mm -hmm. So in other words, you start creating microgrids that overlap with large grids, which overlap with international grids. And at that point, I mean, the UK in theory could generate all its own power tomorrow. But a lot of the systems aren't efficient. Even the national grid's not efficient. For every 100 miles of transmission, you're losing about five to 8% of your electricity, of your power. So the grid isn't even efficient at that status. So I think that's really important for both regional poverty, heat poverty is, and I, I agree that, that, that insulation, changing the construction is the first point. The second is changing how energy is shared, produced, stored around the neighborhood, around different if, parts of the society. If I can jump, National Grid today are publishing their future energy scenarios and in their new scenario, which used to be called Gone Green, but is now two degrees, they're acknowledging this new future, this regional. So when you have the fear mongering that if we have to, like I said, if we have to connect another um, 
large number of electric vehicles because we, we want them because of air quality and, and ex things like that. They've said you need 18 gigawatts more electricity. And then in the same breath, they said, but we can manage it because of this new approach of smart ways of dealing with it. Yet, the media then go, 18 gigawatts needed new electricity, disaster blackout. Honestly, you need to be wiser and aware that there is a revolution with technology and the ways that we are thinking about electricity markets now, that those changes can, with the smart research work going on, that we can deliver our low carbon solution for the future. So, Professor Mundy, what are the, yeah. what are the barriers um, to us all I mean, making our homes into mini power stations, and what are the implications of Brexit and all? Well, going back to the issue, I mean, with, with interconnect, you know, with this issue of interconnect, I mean, all, all, all I would say is this. I mean, we, nobody knows what's going to happen over the next 18 months, but I, I can talk. Um, I mean, you know, some of the consultations that we've done recently, particularly with... Uh, Welsh industries that are involved in processing chemicals and you know, some of the bigger multinational uh, electricity producers here. I mean, they're very worried about issues over um, European energy markets and what a hard Brexit might mean for that. And I guess, uh, I mean, I'm an economist, so we specialise in worst-case scenarios, don't we? I mean, the, the only thing I would say, you know, several of those very large industries in Wales that are major employers... You know, Seth, um, many of them, you know, having, um, you know, they're coming up to stages where they've got to make decisions on major, in, you know, major investments shortly, and this is just something else that's creating uncertainty uh, for those firms. So it's just, a, you know, just another little nail that, you know, is influencing decisions, but will be made elsewhere on new capital investment in the Welsh economy. Okay. Um, thank you for all that. Um, is Jonas Marie Dum Dum in the room? Yeah. Would you like to ask a question, please? Um, well, I have two questions. Um, thank you. Um, first, uh, thank you. Um, well, I don't know what you want to ask. Well, well uh, go okay, ahead. but um, the f well, I'll ask both anyway. Okay. Uh, the first question that I posted was about the role <laughs> of um, the local councils in Wales. Like, do uh, do they have a certain uh, level of um, contribution as to how this uh, this idea of lowering um, carbon all, all across Wales uh, would be, and the second is about um, about integrating as well the uh, hydrogen energy perhaps in Wales because I. As, um, as I understand, Wales is also investing in hydrogen energy. Um, my university, the University of South Wales, is actively involved in that. And how do you see that in the next 30 to 40 years uh, in relation to the topic we have today? Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, in addition to that, we had a, a, a submission from somebody called John Paul um, McCalmont from Aberystwyth University, who I don't think is here, um, who's asking about the importance of biomass in the future energy mix, given the potential of agricultural land for sustainable biomass production. Um, is there anybody else who wants to ask a related question? I work for Cardiff University. Um, also sort of adding on to the hydrogen and the biomass is marine. Because I study marine, and we actually in Wales have quite the opportunity to have a world competitive advantage in marine. And where do you think this fits in? Where do you think it fits in, going back to what Max was saying about uh, regional development? Because obviously we've got Swansea with the tidal lagoon, we've got North Wales, Anglesey. They've got a lot of marine stuff going on there. And we've got Pembrokeshire, who've been losing their oil and gas. And we've got marine energy development there. So where do you think Brexit fits in this? Where um, Welsh <laughs> government fits in with this? And where does marine <laughs> energy generally? <laughs> Move right. on a stick. <laughs> Very good. So we, we've got four technologies that the questions have been asked about. <laughs> so biomass, fuel cell, hydrogen, and marine. So uh, do you want to start? Yeah. Um, in no particular order. <laughs> right. uh, let's start with the, the uh, marine. Uh, I, I agree that I'm actually a big supporter of the tidal lagoon. Right? I think for a lot of reasons, economic reasons, and but also, if uh, I'm, I'm my other position is at Rice University in this in the states, 
And uh, a certain President Kennedy gave a famous speech there where he announced that their goal was to put a man on the moon. And in that speech, he says, we don't do things because they're easy. We do them because we're, they're hard. They're a challenge. So I, I view things like the Tidal Lagoon as that. Someone has to do it first. And someone has to show that it's possible. Uh, the, one of the nice things about the Tidal Lagoon, if you built it tomorrow, I could predict exactly when it will produce energy for the next 100 million years. Right? Phase of the moon, tides, you've got, uh, it's very predictable. It's nice, it may not be the right time of day you want, but it's very nice and predictable. So I think we need to address that. Given the coastline, I think marine energy, and that's one of the reasons we put a, a wave tank in Esri when we built the Energy Safety Research Institute, to study exactly contributions for that. Biomass, I think there's a problem. Um, you know, you certainly don't want to go down the corn ethanol route, which is the biggest economic, scientific, well, okay, I won't use the word I was going to use, but use bollocks, so maybe I can, <laughs> so there you go. Uh, how you say bollocks that have been. But I think biomass for other resources, as in a biorefinery, makes more sense. One of the things people don't realize is that of a barrel of oil, only about 30 to 40 percent gets burnt in petrol, aircraft fuel, and so on. Most of it goes into other things. And windmills and solar are wonderful for producing electricity instead of burning a hydrocarbon. They're not very good at making plastics. Where biorefinery becomes much more important is your ability to do exactly that. You can take carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide with hydrogen, you can do fermentation, you can take algae, you can create uh, um, uh, alpha and omega uh, pharmaceuticals and so on. So I think biomaterials, is, it shouldn't be as an energy source. It can be, but again, in that case, you tend to have a CO2 problem. So I think that's the, the sort of technology needs to be the broadest approach. Uh, it, it, I think I can remember when we had a three-day working week back a long time ago. And the reason was is the UK was dependent essentially solely on coal as an energy source. Irrespective of what the reasons for that three-day working week were, you can't be dependent on a single source. It can't just be wind, it can't just be solar, it can't just be gas, it can't just be nuclear. It has to be everything. Because that then takes the uncertainty of, produ of producing that energy <clears throat> away. So I think it's really important that we take a sort of holistic approach and combine the different forms and understand how you interconvert from wasted electricity to hydrogen to back to electricity. Again, you lose some energy, but then you get it to use when you need it as opposed to when it's being generated. How? Do you want to pick up on the so fuel first thing, cell in particular? And okay, so the marine side, I think the tidal lagoon is really the interesting thing at the moment. Um, I, I thought Marx's point at the beginning was really important. There is the potential for there to be a supply chain in Wales. I mean, certainly if you take tidal lagoon power at face value, and I certainly do, and we work closely with them, it makes sense. I'm not saying that everything's going to come from Wales, the turbines and so on, but, but they're talking the language of an economic development agenda in addition to everything that... It, so I think, you know, that, that was the point that you made, Max, and I think that's really relevant, you know, as we link the, the, the whole, you know, energy, economic future agenda. So that, that I think, is... For me, I, I kind of, I don't quite understand why the Swansea Bay Tidal Lagoon has not been given the go-ahead. If I'm honest with you, I can't, I can't I'm sure there are good reasons, but, uh, but it, you know, I, I would be very pleased personally to see that happening. I think the other thing to say is I'm very glad that you mentioned it, is the hydrogen. I think there is genuinely a, a kind of a gem of real top-class expertise here in Wales in hydrogen at the moment in South Wales and also emerging in Swansea with, with Andy. The, the key words to use today is green hydrogen. The, it can't be brown hydrogen because that's, that's no longer where we need to be going. It's got to be green. And so we need to be looking right now, and it's a, it is, I happen to know because we've got a meeting wearing my hat as fellow of the Royal Society. The Royal Society has got a meeting next week on this very subject to feed into the policy making in, in Westminster. So there's a real interest right now whether hydrogen can be, you know, can be generated at scale, cost effectively, for the UK economy. So, and I think you know, we, we have an opportunity here in Wales to feed into that. 
I'm very interested in hydrogen on the transport agenda because, you know, taking, taking carbon at point sources is, is may, it may be feasible uh, and, it, you know, it certainly has got, but, you know, the distributed sources is something else. And, you know, you know my, um, my good friends in South Wales who are part of this team are talking about hydrogen trains and hydrogen cars and all of that seems to me to be entirely feasible, to be honest, we could get all this. I'm not so sure about hydrogen fire engines, which people are mentioning as well. <laughs> so I'm not sure we go for that. But, but why, not in, on, why not in the South Wales Valley? Why are we wor worrying about electric, uh, you, know, you know, making the, what's the word, making the, the lines electric? Why don't we, if we made them hydrogen trains, then they, they would, that would be a solution, as far as I can see. Before I come, come to Max and Nina, can I just take the question from Alan Shaw of Bangor University? Perhaps I can give, first of all, two, two introductions. Um, I happen to be the General Secretary of the Learning Society of Wales, so I'm very happy to be here for that point of view. I also chair the Science and Technology Committee of the uh, National Estelle Vote, which is going to be held on the Energy Island of Anglesey next month. And as it happens, I've arranged an energy forum of exactly this kind of format. I'm going to ask Jenny to come up and share it, because she can keep the speakers that I will have there in order. <laughs> Now, I'm not a specialist at all in, in, in energy, and my question was very general in terms of how you frame an energy policy. And a couple of key words, some I can see up here about security of, of the supply, the costs, and the environmental impact. Is there a methodology for designing a energy policy by optimizing those kind of parameters or any other parameters that uh, need to be taken into account? Because I know there's a political, very strong political aspect of this, but can there be a vaguely scientific approach as well? Okay, um, so uh, thank you for your question. Um, so Max and Nina, uh, I think looking at desirable technologies okay. in relation to do the skills exist and how much okay. is it going to cost the consumer are okay. important issues. I, ju I just, you know, uh, some quick comments here. I mean, on, on biomass, I mean, it's interesting. Um, I mean, you know, we, we have some biomass capacity in Wales. In terms of full-time equivalent employment that would be supported in Wales per megawatt of installed capacity, comparatively, biomass would always do quite well because you, you will have a, an element of local supply chain. And also, of course, with a biomass plant, you've got to have people on the ground doing stuff. Um, it's not like a CCGT power station. The only thing I would say with biomass, um, that you get your biomass from lots of sources, but if it's Welsh sources, they're limited. If you took the thinnings out of the forestry estate, you're not going to get a lot of megawatts of electricity generation out of thinnings from the forestry estate every year. Um, on marine, um, I, I, I echo uh, How Howell's points about the tidal lagoon. Um, I, I really feel, you know, we, we need to get a demonstrator in the water. Um, not, and you know, echoing some of the points that Andrew had, not just because of the electricity generation, not just because the potential for a local supply chain, but it would be good for Swansea having that sort of innovation happening in Swansea. There'll be tourism externalities for something like that. And I, you know, I, I think, you know, it, it, there's a lot around it, I think, that the Swansea area uh, could, uh, could benefit on. With respect to wave, um, wave and tidal stream, um, obviously there's much less capacity in Wales at the moment. I just feel that, um, I, I can't remember what the figure is, I think there's about seven gigawatts of capacity isn't there around the, the, the Welsh coast. I just got this feeling that Nicola Sturgeon has got a budget line for this, and we haven't. Um, you know, it's very interesting to see that work that's going on up on Orkney. So I just feel we're, you know, we're very close to a very high quality resource, but I just feel the Scots are maybe getting ahead of the, uh, getting ahead of the game um, there. So, um, and that's a shame, I think, because, I mean, speaking from the point of view of our universities, we do some very, very good work on marine uh, 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 turbines in, in, you know, in the various schools. So, you know, we do a lot of the research here, we do a lot of the development here, but we're not yet at that stage of getting a large number of dev test devices in the water. Very good. Nina? Uh, I'm just, I'm going to be quite controversial about Swansea Bay Tidal Lagoon, because as the REO, we fed back about 
what we to, uh, to the Hendry report about it. And then as a businesswoman, I'm going to talk about it. And the training that I've had is that when you make a business case, you really have got to be clear whether it's purely strategic, in which case the money doesn't matter, yeah. or you're going to make the argument, this is going to make money. When you mix and blend five different reasons why you need to do this project, and then you're competing it against technologies who've been put on the same level for the same pot of money, which is the levy control framework, who are being scrutinized to the nth penny on how they justify their uh, contract for difference, you're going to lose. You've either got to justify the renewable energy component of that Swansea Bay Tidal Lagoon and make it crisp and clear, and don't wrap in all the social benefits in there, which is purely a regeneration, value to Wales element, if you want to compete for national UK money. That's just my clear advice, and that's what I put. If you really believe it's strategic, just get on with it. If it's right for Wales, do it. But don't try to make it fit in and compete against solar and offshore wind and energy from waste and advanced gasification and pyrolysis and other tidal projects. Because the one that lost me was when I heard Mark, and I love Mark Shorrock to bits because I know Juliet really well, was, and we're going to have the economy for the oyster beds, you know, linked to Swansea Bay Tidal Lagoon. And that I thought he'd lost the plot here now. He's trying to wrap way too much into this project. It has to be clean, clear when it's talking about financial benefit. If it's a societal benefit, say it's strategic and just get on with it. Anyway, that's, there you go. End of my little... Okay. But, um, but I just want to add about the local councils because that is mm -hmm. a fundamental question. Across Great Britain, we've got some stars of councils who are way ahead who've got their agenda sorted about how they deal with fuel poverty, how they deal with the uh, housing associations. They're using their energy from waste capability. They're tapping into the heat networks, funds. You know, they're not just doing a, a study of it. They're getting on with it now. And then there's some councils which are really are just sitting on their hands. They need to wake up and smell the roses because that's the way that those councils can make money and provide solutions that are low carbon. Come 2020, low carbon has got to be their number one agenda. I have the good fortune of sitting on the board for Transport for London and work with the new mayor, Sadiq Khan. And we looked at Transport for London's delivery on low carbon or air quality and it's a massive, huge estate. And he thumped the table. He said, what we're doing on a carbon point of view is not good enough. It's not a primary factor when we make business decisions. It is now. So every new building TfL are going to build has to meet zero carbon homes criteria. Isn't that powerful when you have that kind of leadership? Thank you very much. Um, we're beginning to run out of time. Is Catherine Griffiths-Williams here? Okay. Oh, she, oh, she, I beg your pardon. Right at the back. Where are you? Hello. Oh, energy policy comes here. Hi, yeah, I'm Kat Griffith Williams from the Building Engineering Services Association. Um, the question is, is about skills, um, training and apprenticeships, really. Um, whether or not uh, we have the skills in renewable technologies and energy efficiency, and whether or not these are going to be related into trades, apprenticeships and training. Thank you very much. Is anybody here from local government who'd like to come back on Nina's point and also the role that local uh -oh. government might play in <laughs> developing skills? Okay. Um, we'll briefly just take that because then I want to come to a, a much bigger macro question. Um, so, developing skills. Um, both Max and Andrew, I think you mentioned it in your initial remarks. Why can't we do more? We've got the bot better jobs closer to home initiative from the Welsh Government, is that going to generate the um, skills we need? I think, uh, you know, as I say, we have with this uh, uh, WEFO what's called a 1.2 project, so it's not a research project, it's actually a demonstrate implementation, so the idea is to actually bridge the, what venture capitalists call the valley of death, 
And as part of that, we're, we're actually quite a large part of that, we're incorporating apprenticeships, uh, especially working with uh, Gower College and, and other institutions who already have programs where they're training people with, sp with skill sets that are related. And, and so you start to evolve those skill sets. And so, you know, the types of skills that are required uh, to run a biorefinery, which takes, uh, you know, waste material from Welsh water and tatar and so on and produces uh, food products or, or uh, supply chain products, are very similar to the ones of the, the person who turns up to repair the plumbing in my house, right? And so the skill sets are there but part of it is to attract people into those skills becomes very important, I think. And so providing the incentive and providing the, the sort of spark. People get inspired if it becomes a, a, a sort of important uh, issue. And so I think providing that inspiration for students uh, and school leavers to understand that getting those skill sets doesn't just mean they get this job but there are multiple jobs out there that are associated with that. I mean, just two seconds bring back to this issue of the biomass. Um, in the thinking of it as an energy source, you've got to be lateral. Every, think of it much more as a map of one person's waste is one person's raw material. So, for example, we're starting a project which involves seaweed from the west coast of Wales and leaves from every council in Wales <laughs> that actually spends a fortune disposing of leaves that are on the roads. I mean, they can't burn them because they contain all the gravel, and so it's separation is that. What we're looking at is carburizing them and providing them as a, a raw material for places like Tatar so they don't buy coal from Germany, right? So you've got to think of these things in a very lateral process. It's not a, a straightforward, and so we're working on what's called a roadmap, joint with Cardiff and University of South Wales and various members of the uh, local governments and local councils in trying to develop for the Southern Ra Wales region a map of all the waste and all the raw material requirements and use that as a guide for every young academic and every young entrepreneur. Here's the problem. Solve that gap. If you solve that gap, you've got a resource and a market, and you've also got a technology which you can export around the world. Thank you. Um, Max, did you want to... Yeah, to I mean, yeah, just very I briefly... I mean, want to I, say something about this. I mean, I don't, I don't doubt, um, you know, the, the state of uh, the Welsh supply side um, in terms of, you know, the local content issue. Yes, it partly links to skills. I don't think anybody w uh, would disagree with that. Several of the industries have done a lot uh, several of the generators have done a lot to work with local FE college to develop um, you know, very, very specialist, uh, very, very specialist skills. Um, but there is a, you know, there's all, I mean, if we're talking about, uh, you know, renewables, um, there, there are relatively few employment opportunities in terms of electricity generation during operation. I mean, if you looked at the whole of electricity generation in Wales and you factored in you know, what indirect and induced effects in the Welsh economy, you're probably only looking at about 5,000 FTEs at the moment, uh, full-time equivalent jobs at the moment. Um, so, well, 6,000, <laughs> so, um, you know, so, there, you know, the, the job opportunities there are actually quite limited. Where there are job opportunities, of course, is in the construction engineering in making these things. Um, and so, you know, when we talk about skills, we have to be, you know, what sort of skills are we, uh, are we talking about here? And the, you know, the supply side in Wales is more developed in, in some of those areas than others. So, Nina, sorry. so how many jobs get created in the renewable energy industry in Wales? Well, it is in, in, I mentioned in my intro, it's about 6,000 jobs and we've got a breakdown for this Made in Britain uh, map uh, across all the different technologies. And I totally agree with you. This is such an opportunity, and we work with, uh, as the REA, with um, the traditional, uh, um, not headhunters, but what you call the job sites, who normally work for getting the skills in the oil and gas industry or the coal industry. And we're trying to show how the like for like switching over of working in all the different renewable sectors. So that's one bit. The other bit that's interesting is that renewables 
attracts more women to come and work in it. 17% versus only 8% in the traditional electricity, energy, oil and gas industry. And the element that's particularly interesting is that you find more women leading these small, medium enterprises in renewables. They are the top people. They are the CEOs, the CFOs, the CTOs. And then when a larger corporate buys them, guess what? They leave because they don't like the traditional working arrangements. And there's so much research on this, and I've got a wonderful graphic which shows all of that. So I'm happy to talk some more about this. My passion very, is now riled. Uh, <laughs> very briefly, how so, I wanted to maybe get Maybe something for, for, through you to Welsh Government. Don't forget the digital agenda when we talk about skills. Yeah. The, you know, the transition that's happening is away from the sort of more traditional electrical engineer towards what kind of is beginning to look a little bit more like a computer scientist, if I'm honest with you. And so I think, I think we have the skills in terms of the raw people, if you like, you know, the young people and even you know, the people of Wales. But, but make a big plea to you, not Jenny, to take to Welsh Government, not to forget the digital agenda. Okay, no, I think we won't. Um, right. Um, and this is going to be our last question. So, Helen Westhead, are you here? Helen, would you like to ask your question? Uh. Um, my question is about how we assure the delivery of decarbonisation targets for Wales. Um, Committee for Climate Change Research is showing that we're failing to deliver on our 2025 targets. What can we learn from that for future targets, such as 2050 greenhouse gas reductions? Um, and does this mean that we need to be stronger in developing more market-specific or technology-specific ambitions? Okay, thank you for that. Um, I wonder if you could all be very brief. What are your top asks in terms of getting us to meet our climate change obligations? What, what are the, going to be the biggest wins uh, and... You know, how, how are we going to achieve them? Max, you want to go first? I think we need to think m much more. Um, and it links back to a point Andrew made at the start. I mean, you could reduce your carbon emissions very, very quickly. You know, if we shut down Tata and Valero, you know, they, they come down very, very quickly. In, in terms of policy, we've got to move away from what I would call production accounting emissions. You're thinking about what, you know, what is actually produced at point sources in, in Wales. And we've got to think far more about what Welsh consumption, how Welsh consumption causes emissions in Wales, in the rest of the UK, and the rest of, rest of, the, rest of the world. I, I, I. So, so it's, a, it's a plea, really, in policy to move away from production, production accounting to consumption accounting when we look at carbon, uh, carbon emissions. That is a good question, and I'm not sure I've got a good answer to it, to be honest. Um, I still feel there could be some um, more that needs to be done in terms of, you know, energy conservation and energy use and so on, um, but it, it, it's, it's a difficult one, I think, at the moment. Well, when I was actually speaking in Scotland, we produced our um, manifesto of the REA, so it's here, so you can have a look what we think are the priorities. It isn't Wales specific, but it is about really being very clear about the options and the value of, of what's important uh, regionally for delivering that low carbon agenda. So if it is about the jobs, then go hell for leather and train people up that are focused on a, 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 a broad skill approach but it is focused towards low carbon. Low carbon should just be the norm now in the discussions, and it shouldn't be being sidetracked. The bottom of the trilemma should be here at the top of the trilemma now. Uh, um, okay, so uh, to quote a, 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 a former colleague of mine, Nobel Prize winner, um, he, his comment was for the future is be a scientist, save the world. Um, and I'll add to that, don't assume the politicians will do it. Okay. Uh, the, the solutions are going to come because, yes, you'll have a target, but it's going to have to be from either developing new technologies, 
changing how technology is used. Um, the other thing is it's not linear. If we start today what our emissions are today and by 2050 we're supposed to be 80% down where yep. we are now, um, it's not going to be at that amount per year. It's not going to be a nice linear plot because technology takes time to implement. And so I think the, the real solution, but I'll say, as I used to say in an old sitcom, Citizen Smith, when I come to power, um, the issue is going to be to implement as many key technologies as possible and target the biggest emission sources that are vital for the economy. So it gets back to industry in Wales. That that's a major source of emissions. And just because you emit it at one point, even if you then consume it, that's OK. So I, again, you have to think of it in terms of the national emissions as opposed to um, you know, emit and consume immediately. Um, and I think if you target those large sources, that will make the biggest bite out of the problem. Thank you very much indeed. We could go on for at least another hour on this fascinating subject. I apologize if you haven't managed to get a question in, but obviously you can approach uh, individual members of our panel uh, um, uh, informally. Um, I, I just want us to end by thanking our illustrious panel, Nina Skorupska, Max Mundy, Howell Thomas, and Andrew Barron. Thank you very much indeed.